and uh, an old school teacher tried to renovate that and you know screwed it up but so it was a collaboration but wasn't simultaneous so the guy painted it in 19th century and uh, it was very nice but you know the school teacher screwed it up anyway um, how many of you know what this is no one really our place Reddit, okay, so how many of you uh, use Reddit? Okay, a few guys. So uh, Reddit ran a very, uh, you know, so Reddit, what, Reddit is a, it's a social uh, uh, network kind of thing where people post stuff, okay? And every April 1st, they do some cool experiment, okay? And the last April, what they did was they built a thousand pixel by thousand pixel canvas, okay? And uh, they allowed people to just put one pixel, okay? Uh, and they, you know, if you had an account on Reddit, you would be able to put one pixel in five minutes, okay? So once you put a pixel, you cannot do that again in five minutes. So this was a very cool experiment. This is a thousand pixel by thousand pixel uh, image, and people actually built this, okay? And uh, it changed throughout the day. But, you know, uh, that, that's the power of uh, collaboration, that is, you know, if you allow multiple people to work together, even you know if they do it one pixel at a time, they can you know, they can build really awesome things. All right. So uh, with that aside, uh, a quick intro to Elixir. Elixir uh, actually, you know, we we heard a lot about uh, Erlang and uh, Elixir, you know, in in the previous sessions. Uh, and uh, you know, Erlang is it's a very battle-tested uh, uh, framework, right? The the Erlang VM has been in production for the last 30 years, okay? And um, it handles almost 50% of the telecommunication traffic, okay? Because it's built by Ericsson, uh, it, it does that, okay? So Elixir is something which is built on top of Erlang, okay? So if you guys have used Clojure or Scala or uh, Kotlin, right? So those languages run on top of the JVM, right? So Elixir is something similar but it runs on top of uh, the Beam. The Beam is the name of the Erlang virtual machine, okay? And, uh, you know, so, so because Erlang is so good, you know, Elixir gets all of that st stuff for free, okay? All right. So let's have a quick demo about, uh, you know, Elixir, okay? So uh, can, can everyone see this? Is this visible? Yes? All right, so this is a very simple hello world command, uh, you know, program. Uh, you just have IO, so El Elixir has uh, something called modules, okay? And a module is just a group of functions, okay? So what you do is you define a module, it can have a bunch of functions, and the way you call it is you, is you say module name dot the function name and give it some arguments, okay? So you can think of it like uh, static classes in Java or C sharp, okay? Where, you know, your class is actually the module, and the function is the function, okay? So here we have some, you know, simple stuff. And um, if I run this, uh, the way you run it is you just say Elixir and uh, hello.exs, and it runs, okay? So nothing fancy there, right? All right, so nothing fancy there. Uh, let's move on to something called the pipe operator. So you guys have seen the pipe operator a lot in the previous, uh, you know, talks. But what the pipe operator does is, if you look at the first line, uh, you may have seen this kind of code in, you know, in Ruby or Java or whatever language you use, right? What you do is, you say enum.max, right? You're calling a function, and that gives you some result. You give it to something else, right? But to read this, what you need to first uh, go to is the innermost parenthesis, right? So you need to go to 3, 4, that's, that's a list, and you need to read it in the reverse order, right? So to, to try and understand what you're doing is you're saying, all right, I have a list with two elements, and I'm trying to get the maximum element out of those, so that's going to be 4, and then I'm printing it, right? So which is, you know, it's going to print 4, right? Now what the pipe operator does is it just takes whatever you have and passes it as the first argument, okay? 
So if you look at this, this is a list with uh, uh, items 3, 4, 5, and it calls enum max with that argument, okay? And then uh, it takes that result and calls io.puts with that result, okay? So it's kind of like the Unix pipe, okay? If you've used Unix, you know, sort, cat, whatever, right? You just chain things together using a pipe, right? So that's what this pipe is, okay? So you'll see a lot of this in, you know, in Elixir code, okay? So what's happening here? You've got uh, a list, you're passing it through enumax, and then you're passing it through io puts, which will actually print it, okay? So if I run this code, the left pane here shows you that you know it's printing four and five, right? So the four comes from the first uh, line of code. The five comes from the the last three lines of code. Okay? Any questions, guys? No, just just some syntax. Okay? All right. Okay. So now, you know, you may think, all right, Elixir looks like a normal language, right? What's so special about it, right? So Elixir, you know, we've heard that Elixir brings concurrency to the table, right? Elixir is, you know, very good with concurrent stuff, right? So let's do something concurrent, okay? So if uh, everyone here understands JavaScript, right? So if I have some code here, which says i, uh, i is zero, i less than 10, i plus plus, right? And I'm gonna sleep, and I'm gonna print something, okay? Uh, so let's say that's 10 seconds. How many seconds would it take to finish this uh, program? Hundred seconds, right? I mean, simple, right? 10 seconds at a time, hundred seconds, right? So we have a similar uh, Elixir app here, okay? So what it does is it says, uh, I have three elements, right, in a list. I'm gonna take that and I'm gonna map through that and I'm gonna for each loop, I'm gonna sleep for one second, and this is just doing a diff of um, the start date, right, and the current date, okay? So which basically tells us how many seconds have elapsed, okay, for each iteration, okay? So if I run this, um, so what do you think we'll see? Minus one, two, three, right? So that, that's the number of seconds which is elapsed for each iteration, right? So the first iteration took one second, the second took two seconds, the third took three seconds, right? Because it's happening one at a time, right? So how do we make this concurrent? We use something called spawn, okay? So basically, let's say you have one guy, right? And you want him to set these tables, okay? And let's say he can do two tables in a day, okay? Now you have 20 tables, so what do you do? What do you do? <laughs> Get more guys, right? Get more guys. So that, that's what uh, the world is moving to, right? So previously we had computers with single cores, right? Just a single processor, right? Which did stuff, right? And processors became fast and, you know, developers were happy because their code was improving with every new release of, uh, you know, processor. But, you know, around 2000, in, in the middle of 2000, right, the speeds became stagnant, right? There was no increase in speed after that. But what happened was the number of cores were, you know, increasing. Initially we had one core, now my computer has eight cores, okay? And, you know, servers have 32 cores, right? Which means you have 32 guys who can set up the tables, okay? But if you use something like Ruby or Python, you'll only be able to give one guy the work, okay? Ruby can just say, you know, do this to one guy, okay? So it's not gonna utilize all the 31 other workers, okay, the other cores, okay? So what, what we're doing here is, let me increase the font here. So what we're doing here is, I've got 10 guys, and I'm mapping over them, and I'm spawning, right? Spawn, what, is, what does spawn mean? Spawn means you've created something, right? So we are creating a process, okay? And uh, you can think of these as operating system processes in that they're independent, okay? But they're not really operating system processes, 
okay. So, which means um, as soon as I come to the end of this, right, I would have 10 processes doing the actual work, right. So, here just to simulate work, what we have done is we said, we're saying sleep for one second, okay. We're just saying sleep for one second. That is just to, you know, simulate some, some kind of work, okay. So, how much time do you think this will take? One second, right? Because what's happening here is we are spawning 10 processes and those 10 processes are doing the work for one second, right? They're not in a line, right? They're not in a line. They're not waiting for the first guy to finish and then start, right? They're doing it in parallel at the same time, right? That's, that's concurrency, right? So this is gonna, this is gonna give us, um, so if I run this, uh, it, it doesn't really print anything, right? So let me just put some debug statements here. Start and end, okay? So there's a problem here, right? Can someone spot what the problem is? It says start and end and in the loop, when we spawn processes, we are actually printing out the difference, right? So it should have printed 10 lines, right? Minus one, minus one, minus one. Sorry? Okay, that's a possibility. But in Erlang, you know, whatever process prints, it gets printed out to standard output, okay? So that, that's, the main process is exiting, right? I mean, before it finishes, the main process shuts down, right? Because, uh, so what, what this guy, what the main process has done is, <laughs> so what the main process has done is, this guy says, all right, set up the 10 tables, and it says, I'm done, and he leaves, okay? And those other 10 guys die, okay? Because there's no main process, right? So, uh, so this is a small hack where we're saying, you know, let me give them te two seconds to finish, right? So I'm sleeping in the main process for two seconds, and uh, hopefully that should give, us, give them enough time to finish, okay? So this is, again, you know, a hacky solution, right? This is not a good solution, but if you see, it prints minus one, minus one, minus one, right? So this is all finished within one second, right? So think about it. If you have a thousand pages to crawl, right? And um, if you, you uh, crawling pages is actually a IO bound thing, right? Because, you know, most of the time is spent downloading data. So if you have 10 cores, you can actually run it as 100 processes, okay? So you can finish 1,000 in, you know, maybe 10 seconds, okay? So that's, that's the kind of, uh, you know, uh, that's the kind of power Erlang gives you, okay? It, it gives you very simple parallelism, okay? All right, so, but, you know, this is kind of a hacky solution. So what we'll do is we'll look at something else, which is built into... Elixir called a sync stream, okay? So again, you know, this, this is built into Elixir. This comes with Elixir. You don't have to, uh, you know, get a different package, okay? So what this guy does is, uh, this guy, what this guy does is, it takes a collection, right? So we have 10, 10 things, and it loops over them, creates one process for each of them, okay? But you can actually wait for them. Okay? You don't have to, you know, use a hack to wait in the main thread, okay? So what we are doing here is, we're saying uh, one to 10, send them through the timer to sleep one second and get the date diff. And we are actually sending that result to the enum map, okay? Which is then getting printed at the end, okay? So now if I run this, how much, um, how much time do you think this will take? Two seconds. Okay, so this is gonna actually take two seconds and you'll see minus one and minus two because uh, task async stream actually allows us to uh, control the amount of concurrency you have, okay? So here we're saying max concurrency is five, okay? Which means task async stream, what it's gonna do is, say you have a thousand URLs and you say download only five of them at a time and it's gonna make sure it has only five processes at a time. As soon as, as soon as one process finishes, it starts another process, okay? 
So you can actually control that by you know changing this uh, this argument. So if I say 10, now we should only get minus 1, right? So and we have minus 1, just minus 1, okay? So anyway, this is another powerful uh, you know uh, utility which comes with Elixir, okay? All right, so that was a quick tour of Elixir. Any questions you guys have? Yes, no? All right, so another quick thing to, uh, to be able to understand uh, sockets is, uh, is you need to understand uh, uh, receives, okay? So Elixir, uh, when let's say you start an Elixir app, okay? Typically, it has around 50 or more processes running at the same time, okay? And those are, you know, Elixir internal processes which do some bookkeeping, some processes store configuration data and stuff like that, okay? Now, let's say you have two, pro let's say you have five processes, okay? And you're, you know, you're crawling some websites, right? Now, you want to get the data from that process, okay? So the way Elixir works is, Elixir and Erlang, they work through something called message passing, okay? Which means, if you have two processes, they cannot share any memory. Okay, so if you've used Golang, right? Golang also has something called Go routines, and most languages, you know, even when you have multiple threads, they can access the same memory. Okay, with uh, Elixir and Erlang, that's not a possibility. Okay, you cannot share any uh, data between two uh, two different processes. Okay, so all the communication happens through messages. Okay, so what we have here is. What I'm doing here is I'm spawning a process, okay, uh, which has just some code called receive, okay. And uh, when you spawn a process, it gives you a PID, okay. A PID is uh, a PID is like a process identifier, okay. And uh, if we if I uh, show you how a PID looks, so you see that is a PID, okay. 0.91.0 something okay so it's a it's a unique identifier which allows you to um, to address that process okay so let's say you want to send a message to that process you need to send it to that pid okay as soon as you send it to that pid it gets that message okay so it's kind of like um, you know our mailboxes okay so erlang actually uses the term mailbox okay which means you have multiple processes each have something called a mailbox, okay? So when you send them a message, the message goes into their mailbox, okay? And then they can, on their own, you know, on their own time, read the message and do something, okay? And maybe write you back a message, okay? So uh, that's what uh, that's what this is. So what we are doing here is we're saying we're, we're spawning a process. We got a PID, right? And then we are sending our PID a message which says add 3, 4. Okay, it's just a message. It can be anything, okay? Um, and what this guy is doing is as soon as it starts, this guy says receive a message, okay? So it's, this guy is trying to, this guy is sitting near the mailbox, okay? And this guy is seeing if there is a new message, okay? And as soon as, as there is a new message, it opens that message, right? And it matches it on these two things. Okay, it says, um, does it match this pattern? Right? Is it an add kind of message? Is it a subtract kind of message? Or you know, if it doesn't match any of those two, it says, I don't understand what this is. Okay, this is not in my language. Okay, this is probably written in Latin. Okay, so um, that's what this is. And what we are doing here is we're just sending it a message called add three four. Right, and if we run it. You'll see it says sum of three and four is seven because we are sending it a message add. If we had sent it a message subtract, it would have said subtraction of three and four is minus one, right? If we had sent it some garbage, right? Foobar, right? It would have said unknown message foobar, right? So that's that's basically how processes work, right? Process is a guy who has a PID, okay? And you can send him a message and he can respond to it. Okay, all right, 
So that is all we need to understand our, uh, our Phoenix stuff, all right. So any questions? Guys, any questions? Yes, no? All right. So, Phoenix is a web framework which is kind of popular in, uh, in the Elixir space, okay. So, it is like uh, Rails to Ruby, right, Phoenix is to Elixir, okay. But it is very lightweight, it does, it is not as heavy as uh, Rails or Django and it is very productive and it is very fast, okay. So, when you render stuff, you, you know, you typically send responses in Phoenix in the order of microseconds, okay. So usually you send a response within microseconds, okay, that is that's how fast it is, okay. And it comes with a data access uh, library called Ecto, it is like an ORM, okay, if you used uh, Hibernate, nHibernate, Entity Framework, right, so it is kind of that. And uh, it does not do asset management, uh, you know, so there is no Elixir tool for that. Uh, Phoenix uses uh, uh, an NPM tool called Brunch, okay. You can e even use uh, something like Webpack or your own, you know, uh, asset management tool, okay. But you know the real uh, the real strength of Phoenix is its uh, WebSocket support, okay. So many people come to Phoenix because it has uh, you know very good WebSocket support, okay. And Rails 5, the latest version of Rails, actually has been inspired by Phoenix, okay. So it has copied a lot of features uh, into the new thing called Action Cable, okay. All right, so uh, demo time. So, um, to, to create a new, all right, so before that, I actually forgot to show you guys uh, this thing called Mix, okay. So, uh, Mix is a build tool which comes with Elixir, okay. You do not have to install it, it like, is a build tool, okay, like Make or Rake or, you know, what do you have for Java, uh, Maven probably, right. So, it is a build tool, okay which allows you to get dependencies, right, and uh, and build build the final Elixir package, okay. And um, to create a new app, we have actually seen this kind of thing before. Uh, to build a new Phoenix uh, Mix app, you just say Mix New, and let us say you want to build a crawler, you just say crawler, and it will, you know, create a crawler, okay. It creates these files, okay. It is a simple scaffold, okay. Now, um, So, this is the typical structure for a mix app, okay. So, you have the config directory, the depths directory which gets the dependencies and the lib directory which has your code and the mix.dxs which has the uh, dependencies, okay. So, here we have only one dependency which says uh, we only want a dependency called HTTP, HTTP poison, okay. So, it is a HTTP client. Uh, which allows you to, you know, make uh, web requests, HTTP requests, basically, okay. So, we got that and what we have uh, here is we have some simple code which has, uh, there is a module called crawler, which is a function called run and what it does is it says HTTP poison get and it, you know, it gives it uh, a URL and it gets the response body and prints it, okay, that is it, very simple. So, if we run that, we can actually run it uh, using this syntax. If I say mix run minus e crawler dot run, it is going to print my IP, okay. So, it is it actually made a request, got back the response and printed the body, okay. And if you want to actually see the response, the full response, you can say inspect the response, right. And if I run it again, you will see that is the full response, right. So, you have a response, you have some headers. You have a body and stuff, right? So it's very easy to use packages with mix, right? You just add a dependency, and you just say mix steps get, and you know you you have it running, okay? So to create a Phoenix application, once you've installed Phoenix, all you do is you say mix Phoenix new, you know some Phoenix app, okay? So let's say this is a hello app, right? Hello app. And this sets up everything, okay. It installs the dependencies, it installs the branch stuff and, you know, 
at the end of this you would have everything set up okay so i've actually done that in an app called hello all right so here is our phoenix app okay which we just created okay now if you look at it it has a similar structure to a mix app right you have uh, config libs depths there is an extra folder called assets which has your css javascript images and stuff okay all right so um, uh, you guys may have used mvc frameworks in the past right rails django spring right so phoenix is also a typical mvc framework where it gives you some controllers um, some templates so views are actually called templates in phoenix and and then the model stuff is actually in a different directory called the, the name of the app okay all right so here uh, just to get a hello page up all i have to do is go to the index.html page just type out hello right hello world right and uh, and once i have that if i go back so i actually didn't refresh the page okay so phoenix also comes with something called auto reload so you just um, strip off these tags save it it has auto reloaded so if you have you know two monitors or you know, something like this you just save your code and it keeps refreshing with your latest um, html and your latest uh, elixir stuff okay so this is very neat right so that's a hello world phoenix app okay so it's a very simple thing okay um, so real quick let's uh, have a quick rundown of how things happen right so when you start a phoenix app the way the way you do it is you so the way you do it is you say uh, mix phoenix server okay you just say mix phoenix server and this starts the app uh, on port 4000 okay and if you see there are lots of red lines there right and what that says is uh, the database hello dev isn't present okay but surprisingly the app is still working right the app is still working right so that that's the supervision in action okay so here we're not really using the database on this page right but let's say your database restarted right in stuff like rails or django you will actually have to you know for before every request make sure your connection is up and then send the request okay uh, but here you can just let it fail okay if your database goes down your uh, repository process which is a separate process crashes okay and the supervisor which is part of erlang brings tries to bring it up okay so it will restart it and since i don't have that um, database it keeps doing that uh, you can tweak how many times uh, you know it it uh, tries to restart it and you know different uh, parameters but you know it it so this so erlang has this philosophy called let it crash okay so erlang says don't write very defensive uh, code okay things are going to go bad right your database is going to crash or there is going to be a network split right there is going to be a network connection error right then you don't have to write you know lots of defensive code right so in the morning uh, in the keynote francesco was saying you know, in some some app there was 25% of code which was just defensive coding right just to make sure all right the database is up right i can ping this url stuff like that in elixir you don't have to do that you just let it crash and the supervisor will restart it okay all right so all right so now let's look at uh, so what i've done is i've actually created uh, an application called socket d okay uh, it's a phoenix application and uh, if you look at the directory structure right it's, it's a typical structure right and what i've done is i've uh, gone to the web directory and uh, page controller actually let me get rid of this okay so um, you know a quick rundown of how things happen right so in phoenix when you start an app when you start the server 
whenever it gets a request, it goes to something called the router. Okay, you may have or you know use something like a router in Rails or Django, right? So here what we are doing is we are saying when you get a request for when you get a get request for slash, send it to the page controller's index action, right? So this is your typical MVC stuff, okay? And uh, here in the page controller, all you are saying is render a template called index.html, okay? And uh, if I go to the template page index html you'll see it has some html right it has a button and a, a div right so if i refresh this you'll see there's a button and some black box beneath it right yeah so very simple stuff right just some html all right now let's let's go to the javascript part of it and uh, that would be in the assets directory and the js file So here, so by default it loads the app.js in, in the layout. So what we have here is we're saying uh, load Phoenix HTML and load a file called socket.js, okay? Right? So Phoenix HTML, <coughs> so when I said Phoenix has first class support for web sockets, Phoenix has, uh, you know, Elixir code for web sockets on the server side, it has JavaScript code on the client side. So you don't have to fiddle with web sockets, okay? Phoenix actually has a very nice abstraction, which we'll see in a minute, okay? So that's what we are doing. When we say import Phoenix HTML, we are importing um, some, actually Phoenix HTML is a different thing, but uh, here, so let me just uh, quickly go there. All right, so what we have here is we have a file called socket.js and uh, this again is being imported from Phoenix, okay? So how many of you guys have uh, worked with ES6? A few, right? So this is the ES6 uh, syntax, okay? So Phoenix comes with ES6 uh, out of the box, okay? So what we are doing is we are saying import the module socket from the Phoenix JavaScript stuff and uh, now we are creating a new socket, right? So this is actually creating a web socket connection from the browser to the server, okay? At the URL slash socket, okay? And uh, so this is actually the initialization stuff. This is where we are actually connecting to the socket, okay? So at this point, we have a web socket live between this, the client and the server, okay? So, um, how many of you know what a web socket is? Almost everyone, right? So, uh, a web socket is a live TCP connection between the browser and the server, right? Where you know, it's not like your typical HTTP where you send a request and get a response, right? The server at any time can send data to your client. The client can send, you know, any data to the server, right? So, it's a it's a full-blown uh, connection, right? So what Phoenix gives you is Phoenix, um, Phoenix adds something called a channel abstraction on top of sockets, okay? So this is basically, if you look at HTTP, right? If you think about controllers and routes, right? You know that when a request comes to a particular path, right? It goes to a particular controller, right? So that's, uh, this is a similar concept, okay, where it says, uh, if the WebSocket request comes on a specific topic, right, so topic is similar to the path, it goes to a specific channel, okay? So a channel is an abstraction, okay? So you can have multiple channels on the same WebSocket, okay? So here what we are saying is, I have a channel called, uh, uh, with the name Infosys, okay? Uh, and uh, I'm just creating a channel and I'm joining to that channel and uh, so at the end of this at the end of this I'm actually uh, trying to join to a channel right so uh, all right and you know, the rest is a very simple JavaScript code what we are doing is I'm getting that black box okay in a variable called out I have a function called print which is appends to that out okay 
and uh, all right, we'll look at this stuff in a minute. Uh, but I have a button called ping, and when when the ping button is clicked, right? When the ping button is clicked, it prints ping, and it pushes a message to the channel, okay? And uh, that message has a name called Dan, okay? Right? So that's that's the that's the important stuff, okay? So now if I load this, if I click on ping, you'll see it has printed ping and it has printed pong, right? So where's that pong coming from? Let's take a look, right? So with you know with with whatever web application you have, you have you always have two things, right? The the client part, the server part, right? Here we've just looked at how to send a WebSocket, you know, how to create a WebSocket connection send it a message, right? Let's look at the Elixir uh, side of it, okay? So the Elixir side of it lives in uh, lib socket D web, something called channels, okay? And here we're saying, if this is like the router, okay? This is like the router where we're saying, if you get a message, if you get a message on a topic which matches info colon whatever, right? Send it to this channel called info channel. Okay, and the info channel is very simple. What it does is it says um, it allows everyone to join. Okay, so if you think about a chat room, right? Let's say Slack, right? You don't want anyone to join any room, right? Maybe you have some rooms where you say, you know, only these guys can view these rooms. Okay, maybe there's a public room, right? So if you want some kind of an authentication authorization scheme, you would do it here. Okay, you would say when you know when someone tries to join, you would say Right, this guy, is this guy authorized? If then you would say okay socket, okay? If not, you would just throw an error, okay? So that's the join part. As soon as it is joined, you have a live connection, okay? And whenever a message comes from the client to the server, it calls a function called handle in, okay? And uh, it tries to match on the first parameter, okay? So. If we, to, if we take a look at the JavaScript code, our JavaScript code is sending a message called ping, right? And on the server side, what we are doing is, whenever I get a message called ping, right? What I'm gonna do is, I'm gonna print it out on the console, and I'm gonna push it back to that socket, okay? So push is a function, which allows you to send a message to the client, okay? So it's the same name, okay? So here you're saying channel dot push from JavaScript. From the Elixir side, you just say push on that socket that message called pong, okay? And finally, what we've done is we've said when a channel receives a message called pong, right? This is your typical J jQuery kind of syntax, right? We say channel when you get a message called pong, just print it, right? Print actually appends it to the black div, right? Clear, guys? So what we've done is, as soon as you open a JavaScript browser, uh, you set up a web socket. Right? So if I actually open up the console, you'll see at the end it says join successfully, right? At this time, I actually have. So let me open the web socket request. And uh, how many how many guys know how to look at WebSocket messages in Chrome? All right, awesome. So this is at least you'll learn this. All right. So in Chrome, um, there is this thing called um, the network tab, which everyone knows. But if you go to the WebSocket URL, okay, if you click on it, now WebSocket messages aren't HTTP requests, right? So if you send hundred HTTP uh, hundred WebSocket messages you won't see 100 network requests in your browser, okay? So you actually need to go to the first request which created the connection and go to something called frames, okay? And uh, why is this guy not showing us anything? Well, okay, so it is. So if you look at this, come on. All right, okay, 
Anyway, so you look at this. All right. Um, so this is not. So if you look at this, these are the messages which are being sent. Okay, well, this is this is the wrong WebSocket connection. So if you look at this WebSocket connection, what happened is, as soon as the browser loaded the JavaScript, it tried to create a connection, right, using the WebSocket. So it joined the Infosys channel, and um, as soon as the server, you know, as soon as the client joined, the server said, "Okay, you're, you know, you're, you look good, right? You can join." right and that's what the server responded with right so if you see the green arrow is the message going from the browser to the uh, server the orange arrow is the one coming from the server to the to the browser okay and what phoenix javascript does is it sends heartbeat messages every few seconds okay so that's why you see a lot of heartbeat messages okay uh, but where is our ping message so let me clear all of this okay and I'll go here, click on ping pong, right? And now you see, it actually sent a message called ping to the server, and the server sent back a response called pong, okay? It did that again, and it got another pong, right? You guys, you guys with me? Yes? All right. <laughs> okay, what's the time? Oh, we are very close. Okay, so anyway, so that's, um, I actually had another demo, but let's move on to our, uh, uh, so we'll look at uh, two more demos, okay. Okay, so that was the ping demo. I actually have another page there called stats HTML, which is a similar page, okay. Uh, but if you look at the JavaScript, uh, what I'm doing here is, if if the loaded page is the stats page, what I'm doing is I'm saying whenever I get a stats message, I'm going to uh, you know get the out element and add the stats dot proc count to my out. Okay, I actually replace it, right? So I'm just saying inner HTML equal to process, right? So I'm just replacing that. Okay, and uh, if you look at the server side. Right, so the channel. If you look at the channel, uh, I have uh, two functions here. Okay, so all right. So here, this uh, there's some new stuff. What we are doing here is we're saying, whenever um, whenever a new connection is made, right, send a message to myself. Okay, so self actually means myself. Okay. So that process, uh, and send a message called emit stats. Okay, and uh, when I get the message emit stats, I'm going to broadcast broadcast uh, something called stats from you know from from my uh, server. Okay, and the stats, if you look at it, it is it it's sending out a map or an object, which is one property called proc count which is actually the length of processes, okay? So this is actually gonna show us the number of processes running in our Erlang uh, VM, okay? So now it says 241, right? Uh, but I'm gonna, uh, I'm gonna put some load on this guy and, uh, what? Okay, I'm putting load on a different guy. All right, so worker, Right, 4010 is the URL. Right, if you look at the process count, it's it's increasing. Right, so what 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 does this tell us? What does this tell us? All right, uh, okay. So uh, what this tells us is every for every request, um, for every request, Elixir the 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 cowboy uh, the cowboy web server creates a new process and it handles that in a different process. So every request is handled by a different process in Elixir, okay? So if you, you know, if you send it like a thousand requests, it will create a thousand processes which will, you know, handle those, okay? So very quickly, all right, so with all that done, 
our Elixir app uh, is actually pretty simple. So now here what I have is, um, I have, this is a different app and uh, on the home page what I have is, uh, I have a canvas element, okay. So canvas is an HTML element which allows you to paint stuff, okay. And uh, I have some JavaScript here which is similar to the previous one, okay. And uh, so if you, so I'm going to start the server and if I go here to the browser, right, so that's a canvas, you can't actually see it, but there's a canvas, okay. So when I, you know, draw over it, it allows me to draw, okay. And um, um, if I draw on a different pane, right, it, it copies those, so let me refresh these ones, okay, so now we have blank canvases. So you can think of this as two different users, okay, and uh, if one user draws, the other user sees it, okay. So how's that happening? Um, so how's that happening? Uh, we have some simple JavaScript code, which, you know, this is some canvas setup, okay. So we are setting up the canvas and uh, we are connecting a socket and whenever, uh, and we are connecting to a special channel called canvas lines, okay. This is a channel which we created and what we are doing is we are saying channel on receive lines, whenever I receive lines. So um, the way I'm, you know, we are doing the canvas stuff is whenever you draw something, it's capturing all the points, okay, all the XY coordinates and, you know, considering that as a single line, okay. And as soon as you stop drawing, it will collect that and send it as a line to the server. The server then sends to all the connected browsers the same line, okay, and the client then just replays that, okay. So uh, on receive lines, we're just calling the function receive lines, and what this guy does is uh, it says payload lines, it gets the lines, and for each line, it just renders the line, okay. And what does render line do? Uh, it takes the line and it moves the cursor to the first coordinate, right? And for each point, it just draws using the canvas, uh, you know, uh, API, it draws a line, okay. So that's what uh, this code. So most of this stuff is just the canvas interface, okay. And uh, the actual, um, the actual uh, Phoenix stuff is what we had earlier, okay. So we have the socket, right. We're connecting to the socket. And we have a we have a channel called canvas lines, and when we receive a message, we just draw the line, okay. And uh, whenever we want to send a line, we just push the line to the channel, okay. And uh, finally, the Elixir code for this is very simple, right? So what we have here is we have a channel called canvas lines. Whenever, okay, so this, this stuff is irrelevant. So whenever I get a message called new lines, um, I get a payload. The payload is actually the, the coordinates of all the lines, okay. And I just broadcast it from this socket to everyone. So broadcast from is a function which does not send it to the, the browser which sent it the message, right. So let's say you have 10 users, right, and Jack actually drew something right, and it sends those lines, uh, you don't want to send it back to Jack, right, because he's the one who actually is the source. So broadcast from uh, does not send it to the socket which it got from, okay, and it sends it to the rest of the guys, okay. So um, so the, the code for this is pretty small, uh, and uh, if, if you see, we are not doing anything special here, right, we're just uh, letting Phoenix handle uh, all of it. Okay, so uh, <laughs> we are a bit over time, but that's it guys, thanks for listening. Uh.